Welcome to Class Matters, the podcast where we ask the question, what would our country look like if it were governed by and for the working class? Class Matters is a project of the Debs Jones Douglas Institute. I'm Katherine Isaac, Executive Director. Today, in Episode 12 of Class Matters, we're talking with labor organizer Jane McAlevey about how to democratize union negotiations and build significantly more worker power by practicing transparent, big, and open negotiations. That's the focus of our latest book, Rules to Win By. And we'll talk about how building power with high participation is the only chance we have to rescue our weakened democracy. Joining Jane are Gordon Lafer and Adolph Reed Jr. Some of our regular listeners will notice that we don't ask Jane McAlevey our signature question, what would the country look like if it were governed by and for the working class? Well, we didn't ask because the entire discussion and Jane's entire focus really is on how we can best get to the point where that question is no longer speculation, but is everyday practice. And that we think you will find is its own inspiration. Welcome Jane to Class Matters. We're thrilled to have you here and welcome back Gordon and Adolph. So I'm gonna get started with some introductions. Jane McAlevey is an organizer. She has turned that organizing experience into four essential books. Most recently, Rules to Win By, Power and Participation in Union Negotiations with co-author Abby Lawler. Rules to Win By is a tried and tested guidebook offering an entirely new approach to negotiations based on transparency and high participation. Jane is currently a senior policy fellow at the University of California at Berkeley's Institute for Labor and Employment Relations, where she teaches trade union and community-based organizations the core fundamentals of organizing and now negotiating to win. You can also find her work at The Nation magazine in her regular column, Framing the Choice. Gordon Lafer's union activism includes running a hotel workers campaign with Local 142 of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union in Hawaii. He served as senior labor policy advisor for the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Education and Labor. He's written widely on labor and employment policy issues. He's the author of The 1% Solution, How Corporations Are Remaking America One State at a Time. He is a professor at the University of Oregon and director of its Labor Education and Research Center. And Adolph Reed Jr. has been involved in working class politics for more than half a century. He's professor emeritus of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. His research interests include American and Afro-American politics and political thought, urban politics, and American political development. He serves on the board of the Debs Jones Douglas Institute and is the author of several books, including The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives, and his latest, No Politics But Class Politics with Walter Ben Michaels. He also has a column in The Nation magazine. Again, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. As we all know, workers in the United States have been over the past few years organizing new unions at a pace most of us haven't seen in our lifetimes. These wins at companies like Starbucks and Amazon are encouraging and inspiring, but the really hard part of unionization is still to come. That is the difficulty of bargaining the first contract. So Jane, let's start with you. And can you just remind our listeners about that process to getting to the first contract and why it's so difficult? Yeah. And thanks for having me. And I'm delighted to be in this discussion with some of my esteemed colleagues with all of you. Yeah, I think just for starters, that most people in the United States, even in the progressive movement, even in the labor movement, actually don't always understand if they've not been involved in organizing, um, actually don't understand that the union busters in a serious or real campaign never leave. So even when workers win the election, if it's an NLRB election, if there's already been an aggressive union busting campaign, it will continue after that election. And I'll talk about the phases of what that might look like quickly. But if there hadn't been a union buster, And the boss was caught by surprise. I've had many of these where they actually believe their workers just love them. Then they hire the union busters like the day of the actual defeat for the employer when our side wins. So either there's been a union buster in there. If there has been, they're staying around for the entire what would be called the entire first contract period with the sole objective of destroying the workers ability to ever get a first collective agreement or first contract. And again, if they didn't have a union buster because they misread the status of how their workers felt about management, they will bring them in at that phase. So what happens under labor law, which I often call boss law, I mean, just really who it works for in this country, but under under what we call officially the National Relations Act, 
once you're certified, and it all gets very Byzantine, so I'm going to try and keep it simple because it gets crazily complex. But once you're certified, so for example, the, many of the Starbucks stores have been certified, and that leads down one route. The JFK 8 Amazon election, for example, isn't certified, which leads a different route in terms of the fight to get to the first collective agreement. Let's stick with the Starbucks ones. Those workers, many of whom voted over a year ago now to form the first of the Starbucks organizations, are already facing down and dealing with the exact strategy that the union busters have, which is if your union was certified by the National Relations Board when you won the election, meaning the employer didn't contest the certification, you have 12 months under the law to reach the first contract or the first collective agreement. And if you don't reach it by 12 months, the employer, now technically the law says workers, but the employer who inspires a worker committee, this goes back to Sears and Roebuck in 1939, the beginning of this whole process of how they do it, the employer will round up some workers and they will pass a petition. And if they get 30% of the workers to sign it, to say that we want to now throw the union out because we didn't even get a first contract, that's when the process begins to then decertify or throw the union out. So that happens in a huge number of cases in the United States. Like many workers will never actually get a first contract at all. And that's just a huge point of confusion in the US. The other thing I'll just quickly say is for the, because it all comes back to organizing in a second. Like I'm going to end it by saying all of these things just mean we have to do organizing differently, better, and a bunch of things. But the other option is JFK 8, the Amazon workers, where the Amazon employer has not even acknowledged that they basically had an election and won it. So there's never been a certification. They went straight to a different playbook of the union investors, which is just contest the election, never certify it. And they will contest it for, you know, 16, 20 years if we left them as we saw in the Smithfield Foods fight, right? So starting in the late 1990s, in the case I write about in my second book, you know, Shortcuts, a long case study on how drawn out that process became for workers who just wanted a union. So that's how complicated it is. And the decision by organizers at the front end of a campaign, whether they're rank and file organizers, whether they're paid organizers, and it's usually some combination of both if they're dealing with a big union investor, whether it's Starbucks or elsewhere, if they're not explicit and upfront with the workers from early in the campaign, that this is going to happen, that there's going to be a fight to even get to the first contract once you win the election, that's a setup. That's just a, that's just a clue before I stop talking, but that becomes then a problem in the campaign, because expectations of workers have been raised that they're going to win this election, it's hard fought, and then they're going to go right into contract talks. And so if, if the spade work hasn't been done properly to say, oh, babes, you know, hey, everyone in this place, hospital, wherever we're at, usually where I am, by the way, this can be a bit of time, and you're going to get to take a nap after your election, and then we have to ramp up in the most massive way about three days later and go harder in the organizing campaign. And it does shift the dynamic once you win, by the way. It gives you a lot of leverage with the public and a bunch of places, but I'm going to stop there. So the main thing is people should realize there's a reason why many contracts take longer than one year. The employer has every incentive in the world to drag their feet, stall, and never even get to the negotiations table. And you only get there if you have a really well-organized fight over power. The lawyers will not save you. The law will not save you. Gordon, you want to jump in? I do. So first, I just want to say how great this book is and how grateful I am that you wrote it. You kind of said this in your introduction, but I want to say also like the only thing that's even in this category, like the, that you would find in the same section of the bookshelf is David Rosenfeld's Offensive Bargaining, which mm -hmm. is not only 30 years old, but which really only deals with the legal and kind of technical negotiating side and not with the organizing side. And there's just nothing until you wrote this. So I, I'm so grateful that you wrote it. And there's a lot of stuff in here that I think is very concretely useful tools and I want to stress also that in addition to you know the problem you pointed out that whatever it is, 30, 40% of new unions never get a first contract because of this. When in the whole labor movement that has been talking about, we need to move from a business model to an organizing model, which people have been talking about and trying in different ways in different places for 30 years, the key place where that change happens, if it happens, is around bargaining new contracts, not for newly organized places, but for existing places. That's the place where the power fights out. That's the place where, where workers get involved. So it's it's critical for that too. I, I also think it's, and I have a lot of things I want to 
ask you about. But one of the things that I think is also important here is that it gets at and challenges different ideas of what democracy is. Because, you know, if you grow up in America, we have a very fixed procedural idea of democracy, which is you elect a representative. The point of that person is to sit at a table and have smart ideas. And that's kind of where it begins and ends. And this in some way is related to that, but is really a different idea of how democracy works. But to start with, I have the question I think I always have for you, which is about staffing and resources. And I'll say that I have, for instance, I've had the experience of unions who say, we want to shift to an organizing model and we want to have all our contract negotiations be mass participatory organizing, blah, blah, blah. And the staff people say, okay, what are the things that we're doing now? Should we stop doing so that we can do that? Mm. And the union leadership always says, oh, you're so smart, you can do it all. And everybody kind of kids each other and bluffs each other, and it's never true. And I, I think of, for instance, you know, one some of the cases you wrote about are education local. So, you know, the people I know, at least in Oregon, often you'll have a staffer for an education union who might have 10 different school districts, and they're responsible for contracts in 10 places, ranging from, you know, 30 teachers to 1,200 teachers. And part of these campaigns, some elements of them take as much time to do in a small unit as in a big unit. So kind of my question is, if, as all of us hope to see, you were the executive director of a large national union and you had to make up staffing plans, is there some kind of rule of thumb that you think this is how much staff you need to do this? Or if you are a staffer and you're responsible for 10 different contracts, it's realistic to think you're going to run one like this and the other nine might be kind of run on the back burner during that year. How do you think about that resource question? Yeah, great question, always. And the first thing I want to say is I reject the idea that we don't have enough resources. I think we have plenty. So, I mean, it's a question of choice, right? As most things that I write about are. Honored that Adolf and I started our columns at the same time. Mine is actually called Framing the Choice, because that is the issue for most of the labor leadership, frankly. Do they want to go down door A, B, or C? Because they're all available. So which one are we going to open and walk down? So... Having faced that question as a local leader myself, you know, I think the decisions that we made in Nevada weren't bad, quite frankly. It led to the organization of every nurse in Nevada, nine out of 10, highest in the United States, more than New York City or anywhere else, over the course of a few years by winning every hospital. Sorry, that's New York City. Ambulances. You know, we very quickly shrunk, immediately shrunk what was called the servicing staff, the grievance staff. But we didn't do it with disregard to the fact that members have real issues that need to be addressed. I think that's where a lot of the error of judgment is or the mistakes are when people do it cavalierly. And this is part of the reason, Gordon, why I've rejected for a long time the servicing versus business union or servicing versus organizing model. I actually think it doesn't help. The semantics of that don't help us at all because workers who really need some help dealing with a racist or an idiot or a bad or whatever, there's plenty of reasons that workers, not just ones who are in trouble, but like Ones who are in trouble for bad, you know, wrong, illegitimate reasons need actually good services. So when we unfolded it, it was never about diminishing the role of taking care of on the job issues that were happening in Nevada. It was about one, the stronger the contracts are, the less grievances we're going to have. Like the stronger you win, the stronger the language we win in the contract, the less the boss can mess with you. Right. If we go from a five step grievance process that leads to eventually arbitration that you have to pick a panel for, and four years later, your grievance is being handled. That's not really very effective, in my opinion. And that's what most unions are doing with all those many staff they have, is following like a five grievance or four grievance step process that's like 30 days, and then 60 days, and then 90 days, and then like five years, your grievance is handled. I just think that's bad. That's just not effective. So we instead, let me just contrast that for many people who don't quite get contract language, you know, we go in to change contract language in the grievance arbitration clause to one step. One, there is one step and you go right to arbitration, right? So if you're a smart negotiator and then you can build the power mm. to win it, the argument to workers is like when I asked them in Nevada, so how long people who were had grievances, how long have you been waiting? How long has this process been going? And I used them as a weapon to transform how we thought about grievance handling. So one was taking the staff off of the ridiculous, absurd process of what is most grievance arbitration clauses and contracts that are far too long and far too ineffective where the boss winds up in control, basically, and shifting it into a worker, like a worker strong grievance arbitration process, which gets it out of management's hands as fast as possible. Because of course, they're going to keep reaffirming themselves. It's like absurd. So 
That's one. And then two, you have to articulate for workers really clearly what that credible plan is. So when the contracts go to one step versus a five step grievance process and we have a preset panel that's ready to go because we, we have that language in the contract and we've already picked our panel, things are going to get much better here, much faster for you in the shop day to day and with your wages, benefits and everything else. Right. If we build the power required to win that kind of language in a contract. So let's like redo how we think about the local and what the priorities are. And then the second quick thing about that, this is just from my learning, my own direct experience. A lot of people who are shop stewards in the rank and file can be very good at sort of dealing with the grievance work and may not actually have the capacity to be good organizers. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Whereas there are other players inside the workplace, what we call organic leaders or natural leaders or informal leaders, who tend not to step into shop steward positions as a cultural norm. They tend to be very good workers, very mission-driven, very focused on their work. They don't want to spend their time sort of servicing a contract or grievance handling. And so those people should peel off with some organizers with a lot of experience and decide to start reorganizing their union and leave one or two of their best grievance handlers at a staff level, literally, which get down to two. There were like 14 when I got to the local in Nevada, and we went to two people one in the public sector and one for the private sector who handled all grievances. And we built a training manual for the stewards. We redid the training manual. We made the steward training manual and a steward program based on direct action as the first line of a fight to solve grievance problems. You got a boss who's a racist asshole on the third shift. Okay, well, we could file a grievance. Let's do that to cover our bases. But actually, instead, let's just do a petition. That's a way to gauge how many people agree with the person and they care. Let's get a petition. Oh, great. Everyone signed a thing saying the third shift manager is a total racist pig and messes with their schedules. Now we're going to march on the manager and create holy hell for the manager. Then if we don't get resolved, we're just going to march straight on the CEO. And and so if grievance handling, which is what all these staff are doing, or casework, they call it in Europe, all the staff of the labor movement are like caught up in all this Michigas and all this crap that's useless and not building the union. It's not building the union. So get them off of it. Take your very best ones who really like workers, leave them with the shop stewards who are quite capable of doing that kind of work, and then either retrain or invite to go somewhere else the staff positions you have. I had to invite many to leave, and you do that easily by giving them a new job description where they have work to do. And suddenly, they're going to go to a different local because work was not something they were used to doing. And then you have a bunch of money in your budget all of a sudden to hire like really good organizers with really good experience who can then go in and actually help you rebuild the union one contract negotiation at a time. Because every single contract negotiation is a gift to both rebuilding your union and democracy and building a bigger program and all that stuff. I think it's really quite possible, but it's not obvious. Like a lot of things about good organizing are quite possible, but not obvious unless one points them out. So I'm trying to point this approach out to how to do negotiations differently in this latest book. But Here's the question about how you educate mm. people to understand democracy and the relationship between democracy and power. And just to give you know some background, right? You've talked a lot of places about identifying organic leaders and defining leadership according to structure tests. You know, a leader is somebody who can get their people to participate in the things that the unions are doing, which is different from the qualities that often get people elected. And you know, to give like I'm working now with a a big union of people in their early 20s many of whom come out of Democratic Socialists of America, but good organizers who, one, had an idea that, well, unelected leadership is undemocratic and unaccountable, so it's really important that things be elected, right? which is different from saying, who are the organic leaders? Mm -hmm. And then because everybody has so deeply in their head the procedural idea of American democracy, they think you know the problems that come up with elections is people can get elected who are not actually organic leaders and who don't know how or don't particularly want to do the organizing work. Once they are elected, they conceive of their roles as being smart people who represent things and then think somebody else is going to do the organizing. And then other people who are not elected drop off because they think, okay, well, we chose the leaders. For instance, the idea of democratizing power is, I think, foreign to a lot of people in the country. It's very easy to build a procedurally perfectly democratic organization that is substantively powerless, right? And negotiating that, there were some things that I thought were really interesting and useful in your book, like some of them saying that for a candidate to be nominated to represent a department, they have to have a certain percentage of people signing there. And I'm curious to hear more about that and what's the percentage. Mm -hmm. 
that units can only elect representatives after they have a majority participation in the survey or something, that candidates sign position descriptions. So I thought all of those were really smart ideas and things I hadn't seen before that I'd love to hear more about. But also, yeah. if you encounter this and how you explain to people why this is more democratic or equally democratic than the kind of democracy that they're used to and that they normally think of as, oh, now the union certified, now we should have bylaws and constitutions and all the stuff that looks like Congress or City Hall? Yeah, great question. And I do think, you know, there are very few things that are, to be clear, like I always say to people, to be clear, all of my core fundamental work was taught to me by some brilliant mentors. Like every every good thing I do has been passed down from basically the 30s. So then when, when it comes to negotiations, I've spent every single time I have a contract, every time I'm running a new experiment. And I, I could go through 25 years of experiments. I'm experimenting every single time with tweaking something about it. So for starters, let's take where you were on the elections. I went from the idea that you have a big representative committee, right? That was 1199 training. So my my mentors at 1199 New England specifically said two things. Before I left there, I learned two things about negotiations. One, it's smart to have a big and representative committee. That was the language, meaning every kind of worker covering every kind of shift, because that's going to make the whole process smarter. That seems to make sense, though it doesn't apparently in most American unions, but it's logical. You know, if you're going to talk about all the workers, then why not have one of every kind who's there? Okay. And they also said, you know, negotiation should be open, just open to all the members. And that's basically in the constitution at 1199 New England. So that's where the foundation of my ideas come from. And I did exactly one round of negotiations before I left New England and then was thrust into massive, endless negotiations for like the next decade and incredibly contentious ones with some of the top union busters in the country that we know of, including Brent Yesen, who was like a particular, and Larry Arnold, and a whole bunch of names I could drop that if you're in this world, are like the most vicious pricks there are in union busting, who were really out to stop us from getting a first contract in the new organizing we were doing, and were equally committed to destroying the union if it was a successor contract. Like they were going to strip the union out of every hospital as we won them. So first of all, to get right to this whole question of our conception of democracy, you know, we're one of the few countries that doesn't have like some system of mandatory voting, let alone encouraging, you know, that people should vote, right? So of course our ideas about it are completely contorted. But for me, what it meant, because I think of the workplace as like an experiment in building, not just democracy, but to me, the word I'm using a lot in this book is governing power. Like mm -hmm. what's governing power, which gets to the whole point of the method of trying to build really high participation in the setting of the policy has to do with, can you then govern your workplace? Like how many people actually understand the laws we're passing, the policy we're making in the contract negotiation process? Because contracts are a form of either public or semi-private policy in my view, right? We know that. So I look at it as policymaking. And I do in the last chapter try and extrapolate this, right? Mm -hmm. To like, Kamala Harris's ridiculous quote about no one wants to see the right. sausage be made. And I'm like, dead wrong. Anyway, yeah. we need to see the sausage being right. made. But anyway, so, yeah. you know, I look at it as a mini place to test all sorts of ideas. So I went from like, okay, I got to Nevada. But in the, okay, so it was a fairly not hard negotiation I was doing in New England. Then I got dropped into a right to work wild state Nevada, right? Where there's crazy union investors. And I have two first contracts, like there's a desert filed before I show up. So I'm walking into a desert in two big hospitals. And I'm like, I don't even really have time to elect people. So, the, you know, the real story is in the, in the first book, which I just said, everyone's welcome. I didn't know what to do. Like, literally, I had no staff. I was firing them or they were leaving because they had job descriptions with accountability. I was trying to do that change. And I just said to the workers, just invite everybody. You know what I mean? That was what I was doing in the round one to try and get a lot of people in the room to understand they were going to rebuild their union. Then I slowly began to realize we can structure participation. If we want to structure how to build high participation, either in civil democracy, but I'll stick to the workplace right now, we can structure participation in the workplace. And so that's when the experiments began with, okay, now that we killed it in those first few contracts, by the way, killed the union buster and won the best contracts in the history of Nevada, round one. I mean, that was a crazy series of fights. So now we had raised expectations all over the state. Every possible worker wanted the contracts we had just won. And now we could sort of slow down in the organizing, in the organizing work. And then a lot of, Catherine, to your point, a lot of first contracts. I mean, I was just like back to back to back to back to back to back to back first contract fights and some successor ones along the way. But we were just doing so much in organizing, it was endless first contract fights. So I started to say, you know, here's the deal. 
looking right at every worker coming into like a, you know, so contract planning meetings, everyone's welcome, wide open meetings. The first was setting, establishing that I wouldn't sit at the table at negotiations unless 65%, that's 65% of the workers participated in the contract survey. And people were like, what? So it starts with the survey. And why? And I would write on the survey. My surveys from those years all look very different than most union surveys. And people have asked for them. I should should post them somewhere. But anyway, because they do a power analysis in the contract survey, like for workers to start learning from the very first thing we're looking at. It usually has a picture, like the survey starts out with a picture of the boss and some asshole quote that they've said at the very top of it, just to like remind them why they're filling in a contract survey. And then it says your unit doesn't get representation until 65% of you participate in the survey. Why? because you're not going to win anything without that participation, period. So we start the messaging that in order for you to win, so we're raising your expectations, but I'm also being clear as an organizer while I'm raising them. You and your coworkers cannot win these changes unless you are strike ready. That's going to be 90% organized and 90% united on your demands. So we start with structuring it in the contract survey, right? So once you get 65%, just to get just to go through what I learned all the years, I got it down by Philadelphia, by the wars I was doing in Philadelphia, not that long ago, in the hospitals there, which was 65% minimum threshold, unit by unit on the contract survey to drill home. That's a minimum participation. You're going to need to win anything here. Secondly, at 65%, you can hold an election in your unit, day shift, night shift, and both shifts have to hit 65%. Now you can hold an election in your unit for your representative to the committee. The nomination process, the people being nominated have to sign off on a set of rules that they've seen. We have a job description for what it means to be a negotiating team member. So it's a one page short description. I will communicate two ways. I will always be clear with workers about what's going on. I, you know, There's a little job description about the principles of being on a transparent negotiation. So someone can't say, well, I didn't know that was my job later, right? So you have to sign off on that they've seen the job description for what their job is, if they're going to run at, for office as a negotiating committee member. And they have to get at least 25% of the unit to sign their petition. So you're not going to get the wrong person at a 25% of your unit has to sign your candidacy for nomination. If you don't have some real juice, you know, some respect going in that unit. If it's a lower number, people will just, or my experience over the years was people will just be like, same thing, any Tom, Dick and Harry activist, oh God, you go do that. I don't really want to do that. You know what I mean? If you set a higher threshold, you're again, you're structuring participation and you're creating mechanisms replicable mechanisms to get the right people in position to then lead the contract campaign. And then anyone's welcome after that. But, and so it continues. We also do, you know, so the contract process is wide open. The survey process is wide open. The meetings are set every week. They're right next to every facility. And the last thing I'll say about it and then stop on this one is I also began to always ratify the contract proposals, which was just another structure test, not just ratify the contract, but actually ratify the proposals Mm -hmm. ahead of time. Again, just to create another structure test, just to, just to see where were we at as we were heading to the table, like how strong was the organization of the workers. And then secondly, as one last way to say, if this turnout isn't good, we're in trouble. And like, I would use that. Like to me, everything is about being fully honest with every worker I've ever met about everything I've said in any book and to any staff person anywhere. I say to all the workers, like, I'm happy to be your chief negotiator. I love negotiations, but here's the deal. It doesn't matter if I'm clever or not. If y'all don't build the power to 90%, north of 90% unity with really high solidarity, you're not going to win jack shit. So let's just be honest about it the whole time. I can be really clever and it won't matter. And then also, I just, I don't want a worker or I don't want the boss to say, you know, how did that come across the table? Because they do that all the time. So that's like inoculation against union busters. If you ratify the proposals up front. Mm -hmm. And it's also like an inoculation against Kvechi or or union busting sort of workers among the ranks later too. And I've had plenty, you know, there's, it's all been there. So all of those things. And by the way, I will close by saying the whole original conclusion of the book was me and knowledge. I wrote an entire conclusion that basically carried all these ideas into how Biden could have won Build Back Better in mm-hmm. his first year. And the peer reviewers all made me cut it. So obviously there was hmm. a reason. Everyone keeps saying, can you go resurrect that? I think you could take the model of what I'm describing into public policy making. Okay, well, that sounds like a good bridge to Adolf. Adolf, you have the grand unified theory question. <laughs> oh, well, not exactly, but yeah, I'm getting there. Hey, look, like this book, like everything else that you've done is brilliant. And part of the brilliance, I think, is that, I mean, you know, like a lot of us or some of us have been calling for revisiting the 1930s understanding of what it is to organize. 
that's been out of fashion for so long now that it feels like unless you're talking to an author cock, they don't even know what you mean, right? But what you've done is tell us what it means concretely, like for our times and for the generations of boss law, as you put it, that have structured the context in which we organized since then. And on the Build Back Better point, what I couldn't help read, like all the way through, read the argument, what I mean, not just as an affirmation of what we need to do to rebuild the labor movement, but also what we need to do to build substantive democracy in American politics. And I'll be honest, look, I've, I've stopped talking about democracy a long time ago because it's kind of like saying socialism. Well, when you say it, what I mean, most people think it means something entirely different or I don't know what the hell it means or they want to cross themselves and go on with it, right? But you lay out what substantive, practical democracy means, right? And how to attain it concretely, which I think is also very useful for you know, all kinds of activists or what want to be activists or as a component of political education for everyone, both in a sense that you specify mechanisms, concrete mechanisms, like especially the structure test, which drives most people out of the room at this point. It drives the dilettantes out of the room at this point. You know, which also makes it useful. But going back to the Build Back Better point, and I want to join the party who would urge you to thumb your nose at the peer reviewers to do this article. Because it strikes me, and you make this point in the current conclusion anyway, and as much about Germany as about the US, that one of the reasons that working people and working class broadly, and Americans, since most Americans are part of working class in one way or another, are facing such fraught conditions now with respect to not just our actual futures of material existence, but survival of like any kind of meaningful understanding of democracy, right? I mean, because shit, there was just a vote in Turkey, for instance. So that's obviously not it. And one of the reasons, right, a very important reason that we're in that position is that the exclusion of working people from participation, meaningful participation in the decisions that have any impact on their lives, both from government even through their unions, but I mean, much less like for people who aren't in unions on an everyday basis, has like open space for the dangerous right wing to provide what seem like on a first blush, what seem like plausible explanations of what the sources of their problems and insecurities and anxieties are and solutions to them that are also, you know, may seem, seem plausible, but are also false. You know, one of our audiences is local union leaders who are concerned about this kind of slippage, you know, both inside the union and in the broader political sphere, as it becomes clearer and clearer that if the entities that Gordon wrote about in the 1% Solution, which everybody needs to read, a very fundamentally anti-worker agenda that they want to ram down the rest of our throats. And the question is, how do you see our both in unions outside, employing this model, this approach of yours, to counter that strain of union busting too. It comes from the Koch brothers, like and the rest of that. And I mean, it's always consistent, obviously, with your previous argument for total or whole worker organizing, which is part of the story. But what do you have to say? Oh, well, you threw me to it, going towards whole worker for a minute, although it is all part of it. As I say in the book, yeah. it's just it's just in phases, right? The work, the, the, right. The work site has to be strong first. You can't go do brilliant work outside the workplace unless your workplace is strong. So it's a priority order. So I think, I mean, one of the things that I try to convey in the book, you know, something called democracy. And that word to me is just like socialism and all of it. That's what, and organizing the, what, the same thing. That's why I wrote a book right. defining it. You know, it was right. like I'm tired of this debate. So like you're mobilizing. Right. No, that's not organizing. Right. Right. Okay. Yep. So I think political education is essential and it's only going to get more essential so right. the yep. role of political education in the movement is fundamental to how the working class may govern or could govern. And so to me, you know, again, somewhat shaped by my Highlander years in a really good way, I think, you know, political education is not standing up and lecturing mm -hmm. at a bunch of workers about how things work. It's structuring participation so that they learn themselves right? Participation is like, we know from like the learning heads, you know, people, how many people learn by listening? How many learn by reading? How many learn by doing? How many learn by combination? So we know most people learn by doing, right? That was certainly drilled into my brains in my young twenties in the South at Highlander. 
So stop coming in with PowerPoints and figure out a simple flip chart and something else and get it done, you know, in a different way. So I think the act of workers participating in the negotiations process is fundamentally the best political education humanly possible. We get to the finances of the employer. If it's in the public sector, we get to where did the money go from the public budget? Uh And then we start a discussion about taxes at some point. If we're in the so-called private sector, because remember, I don't really believe there are sectors, just one capitalist ripping off one sector, whatever. Anyway, so, but in the so-called private sector, you know, then we're dragging in the VP of finances or the CFO or whatever their title is. And those are always my favorite sessions when we're going to torture the finance people who are lying through their ass about how much money is available. Because simultaneously, we we do have those full-time staff who really matter by the way, to the people who don't believe staff matter. Then we've got the research staff listening in on the mm-hmm. shareholder calls where they're hearing a very different story about what the company is saying. And then we force the employer to square that. And I always pack negotiations that day. I'm always like, we are moving the message. Like we pack them in like hundreds in the day that the VP of finances or whoever it is is going to come in. And that is the best, I have to say the word capitalism, ever. I'm just exposing mm-hmm. it for all of its flagrant violations of our humanity. And I'm just going to walk people through and help them realize that they're being completely lied to, like fundamentally, and then help them connect the dots immediately, you know, about why that is that way, because we make the discussion a much bigger discussion, right, by choice. So we'll ask questions, like after the boss comes in and does their lying session, you know, we'll have a bunch of workers. If we've got a bunch of confident ones, you can ask better financial questions than me. It's the whole point of big and open negotiations. It's like, this is the best political education of this system, humanly possible for the working class. So why not we all try it fast? You know what I mean? So I think that that's the first principle that if more people understand something, the better they are able, right? Not a new concept here. The more people understand something, the more able they are and more likely they are to participate and engage. And back to something Gordon said and bringing it back to this one, and then I could talk about the Build Back Better thing for a minute. And we were time to start making our contract plans either for a new contract. That's a fun way to do it. We just take the best contract in the market, hand it out with a checklist, like which of these do you want? Which ones don't you want? Used to make the boss crazy in Philadelphia taking that best hospital contract and just smothering it all over the whole market. Or if you're an existing contract, you know what I mean? And then saying you're welcome to join an article committee. Anyone can be a member of an article of the contracts committee. That's where you find out who cares about what issue, right? Mm-hmm. Deeply. The workers sign up for that. Then that's another way you're structuring even more participation. You don't have to come, but the day your article is going to be discussed, you damn well need to be there and need to bring everyone else on this committee, right? So then you're, you're building interest. And you're learning who's good at math and who cares. And who uh, there are workers who can walk their health insurance plans around circles around me, for example. Another thing I hate doing is talking about health insurance in negotiations. I just let the workers do it because some of them can just get into the minutia of those plans. Mm-hmm. When people understand, they're going to engage and participate. Yeah. And if they don't, right. they're going to sit home. And that is a metaphor for the whole of our society. Right. And so in this approach, it is maximum and it is structured. And I think that is what is required. But I basically said, you know, the Kamala Harris quote that I used in the opening of that chapter was about a quote. She was like on CNN and someone asked her the question. It was like September already. It was obvious to all of us, Build Back Better was going down by September of that year. And so they press kept asking what was the status. And this was where, you know, someone was waiting for like a magician to pull Joe Manchin and in that moment, Joe Manchin and then Wicked Witch Cinema, you know, out of a rabbit hat, like they were just going to magically change their mind. Like we're under some 1972 Joe Biden Senate rules of fairness or something anyway, when unions still have more power. And it was so painfully obvious that that was not going to happen. So let's just pretend that Joe Biden wanted to pass mm. it. Let's just just pretend yeah. that because I'm not sure he did. But, you know, if he wanted to pass Build Back Better, yeah, a lot of smart people in that administration, like what would you have done? I would have, as I outlined in some detail, started by going directly into West Virginia, for starters. And I would have built a negotiations committee, a West Virginia negotiations committee. And how people would get elected to that committee, which I went through some detail in, would be that unions would actually elect members, not their top position holders. I call those people position holders. That unions would get to elect representatives to a statewide Build Back Better West Virginia, like each state that needed we needed to move a major asshole in to get the policy through. 
you didn't have to do this everywhere. Got back to Gordon's resource thing. We couldn't do this everywhere, right? Not overnight, but we could have done it in West Virginia and Arizona. There's some very good unions in both of those states just to anchor it. So like who had the idea of what the negotiation could be? And then you transport all these same approaches. But in this case, you go to faith-based communities, you go to unions, you go to structure-based mm-hmm. organizations in West Virginia, and you say, you know, it'd be much better if West Virginians were actually understanding and debating out with Joe Manchin what the hell their senator was going to do in terms of moving him and holding him. And I laid a whole framework out, basically, of like electing a big negotiations committee, having a survey done across all the participating organizations about what they wanted, having them be the driving force, not as the right wing populists are doing so well, not the elite Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, people from D.C., right, to have like an entire West Virginia negotiations committee in charge of moving Joe Manchin's vote, in charge of exposing him, calling him out to public accountability meetings, chasing him like stuff that I was doing in Florida with the Florida recount, whatever. There's a million things we can do once we have a bunch of people trained to an idea with what we call a credible plan to win versus a bullshit plan to win. And I, you know, I think you start to play it out. And it's like, if all the West Virginians really understood what was at stake, because they would be actually getting into the details of Build Back Better, Mm -hmm. and how much in it there was for them, I think we could have moved Joe Manchin. I'm just saying it. And I think we could have, we could have helped, we could have hit the other one, whatever. We could have moved them both, ultimately, with an approach like that. And we could have moved into it very quickly. It wasn't going to be a mystery. Cinema became a mystery. You know, and that one we un- we unearthed quickly that she was nuts. But mm-hmm. Mansion, you know, we knew from day one was going to be one of the leading right. problems. So put the climate kids with the just transition numbers in there. You just put them all on a big negotiating committee and actually have them deeply invested in working it out. And with really good organizers on the ground. And we could have actually, I think, moved them. Yeah, that sounds right to me. And it's another conversation. But it's curious. That was obvious to us. It was also obvious that, you know, that the administration had always known that Manson was not going to get behind this and kept kicking the can down the road, when either hoping that some magical intervention was going to happen, like you said, or that they'll bullshit the rest of us like for long enough that we'll forget that they always knew about it, which would be a little closer to the they never wanted to do it anyway. side. Right. Yeah, I think so. But had we built that kind of movement in, part of what was so different about Bernie Sanders for me was that Bernie would talk all the time openly that if he ever did get to win, he would need people immediately to help force policy change, right? That was the, to me, the critical difference in his candidacy versus everyone's was his understanding of power structures. And so, yeah, I mean, had we built the power structures to actually pass Build Back Better? Which again, maybe even Bernie and our people and a lot of energy got dispersed. But, you know, if we wanted, I really, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to believe it until I'm whatever. I really think we could have won that legislation if we had immediately put a smart plan. We call that a credible plan to win step three in an organizing conversation mm-hmm. and align the right people state by state in fights to move um, the intransigence. Yeah, I agree with you. And I'd suggest that at the very least, Right. If we hadn't won the vote, we would have won through losing. Right. In the sense, we would have built something that that could endure, which actually uh, you know, leads to my penultimate question slash comment. I'm not sure which it is yet. You'll get me there. But I mean, you know, the organizing model or approach that we all agree with here. Well, one thing I've noticed is that a response coming from a lot of, you know, earnest, good hearted, well intentioned people, either explicitly or by implication, is that, well, yeah. But the dangers that face us are so great now that we don't have time to think about stuff like that. And all we can do is fight to hold on and mobilize against the greatest danger facing us. To which my response has been, well, but the main reason that the situation is so bleak now is that you weren't trying to do this 40 years ago. And there's no way back machine. So like, we have to do the same thing no matter what the short term or the intermediate term or even the long term dangers are. And if we think about political education among people who understand themselves to be politically engaged or activists or whatever, well, I think that's part of the story, too. Yeah, I completely agree. And here's what I you're making me realize. I forgot to say something when Gordon was asking a question about resources, because it kind of gets related. Yeah. So one is there is this idea that organizing takes a lot of time. And I'm I'm here to say it's a bunch of bullshit when you Mm. do the methods right. From day one, 
yeah. a contract fight is like 12 months, a good one, the kind of describing. But they're not even less. I talk about in when I was leading the campaign in Philadelphia um, at Einstein, which it turned out to be when I believe Gordon, some other people were involved in the report that DPI put out that Einstein had been one of the top union busters in the entire country, $1.1 million that were spent mm. fighting us. I knew there was a lot of union busters. Um, to the point of like, how long does this take? The election was April 10th, April 8th or 10th. And we had all of that thrown at us. We had multiple rounds of appeals by the employer. Like we kept, we kept winning and they kept appealing it. Meaning we kept winning at the NLRB, but it was a sideshow for us. Now I'll tell you why, because what we were doing was organizing while the lawyers did the lawyering thing. And by December of that very same year, we had a killer first contract. So that's eight months because of all the mechanisms I started talking about with Gordon. We were doing everything together. We immediately started to do the contract survey process. We just kept their focus forward. But anyway, it's a long way of saying organizing. Like this is the latest excuse. There's two that make me batshit crazy right now. The, The it takes too long is not particularly new. But I will just want to say that the second one is that everyone believes they're in a high turnover workforce and that's why they can't do organizing. And it's also bullshit. Everyone's in a high turnover workforce. This is like capitalism on steroids. Nursing home workers turn over every year and a half. When graduate students say to me, we're only here for like five. Okay, they're mostly for seven or eight. Like we're only here for a fixed amount of time. I'm like, do you know what the average turnover is in a nursing home in the United States? Get your shit together. Like go organize. Mm-hmm. Seven, six years, that's like huge amount of stability for a workforce. So everyone believes they're in a high turnover workforce. So these methods don't work. That's the latest one I keep hearing. And I just keep running through how it works and why it could work. Now that I've been deep in them, meh, core people are there. We know who the organic leaders are. We know the positions they're in. It's really actually pretty obvious. So, but I'm just going to end it by saying it's just good organizing if you're actually doing organizing and not mobilizing and not right. bad something, right. does not take long. It does not take long. It was amazing that we won that contract that started out with suing the labor board to remove the case because they colluded with us and suing the union for cheating and McAlevey and everyone else personally, you know, terrorizing workers whenever they wrote down in their documents. And that's why I say in this book, and that, that was the point I was making early on, every contract negotiations is a time-defined, generally short way to create massive urgency and rebuild your entire union, every one of them. And I think people should take a look at the nation column I did, the most recent one, no, second to most recent one, where I talked about the Amalgamated Transit Workers Union, oh, who has yeah. made the decision to like actually, it's the first national union I know, I mean, UE might have, I'm assuming, but first non-UE union that has actually embraced transparent, big and open negotiations from the top. And I'm pretty deep in discussions with them now, and it's pretty interesting. They also believe in only short contracts, which is something I recommend in the book also. Mm. It is wild about the ATU. If you're a member of any local Malcolm Transit Workers Union, you cannot sign longer than a three-year contract without permission of like the National Legal Council. Mm. That was in every constitution, honestly. You know, look at inflation, look at cost of living, look at the political education work we have to do, look at the election cycle. Like if you structure short contracts... And then you appreciate your contract is great political education and a way to build your union stronger. You've got a baked in structured way to do radical political education, build a really strong union and what's at stake. And you do that starting with doing it in your workplace. And then you carry it out to civil society. That's the promise. That doesn't take long. Can I have one last little piece, which is, A, Jane, you need to write that last bit about Build Back Better. And B, like at the risk of knowing there's probably a long line of people saying, Jane, here's the next book you should write or here's, you write this book. But you or somebody should write the book about bringing an organizing model to politics. You know, my experience of working on the Hill, even, you know, I was working with George Miller and Rosa DeLauro, who are very strong, progressive, pro-labor, as, as good as it gets in the Congress. But the idea about anything, if you said, oh, we want to make sure we want to get rid of tip credit so that waiters and waitresses and bartenders get the same minimum wage as everybody else, it wouldn't be that hard like to go into key districts or key states and, mm-hmm. and find everybody who's working for tips for two thirteen an hour. And or like any idea like that is so foreign. And part of that, I know everybody on this on this call knows, is that 
even in the unions that do good organizing and good contract campaigns, SEIU, Unite Here, CWA, the people who do politics do not come out of organizing. They come out, you know, they ran a gubernatorial right. campaign, then they worked right. for for the Sierra Club, and now they're working for yeah. SEIU. And they're good at some things, yep. but right. they but they're this is totally foreign. And you know, we're a lot of unions at least talk the talk about organizing. Oh yeah, we believe in one on one. We believe in blah blah blah. What actually happens is different, but nobody is even saying we have an organizing model of doing politics. And I think right. you know, even the stuff that you've said on this call, and I'm guessing the rest of what you you wrote and have not yet published, would be a great first step towards trying to open things up in that direction. Oh, yeah. I'm going to second that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I agree. I, I, nice to have you all. Nice to see okay. you. Thank, Thank you so, you much, so much. Gordon, Jane, yeah. was, Gordon, was fantastic. Jane. Have a Take good care. one. Great to see you, Jane. You too. Yep. You too. You've been listening to episode 12 of the Class Matters podcast. We were joined today by Jane McAlevey, Gordon Lafer, and Adolph Reed Jr. Our podcast engineer is Jimmy Wirt. Subscribe to Class Matters wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you can, support us on Patreon and get your hands on a copy of Rules to Win By at janemcalevey.com. And thank you for listening to Class Matters.